Hello again, I'm Doug Smith, and welcome to the 7 September 2018 edition of Portsmouth This Week. Our guest today is uh, State Senator Jim Seveney from uh, representing Districts 11, Portsmouth, Bristol, and Tiverton. Welcome back to the show, Jim. Thanks so much for it's having me. It's always good to have you on board. Thank you. Uh, you're in your second year now as a senator, mm -hmm. and you just completed the 2018 session at the House. What do you consider the most important piece of legislation that you sponsored or worked on th that this year? Well, I think the most important piece was probably the uh, uh, the uh, mental health policy bill. It was uh, it, it was uh, sponsored first by the by the governor's office, and uh, so I took it through the Senate. All I, what, what I didn't know uh, before this legislation came along is that. If you have a, a physical issue and you go to the hospital, you pay your copay and they fix you and you're done with it. If you have a, a behavioral or mental health issue, um, the insurance companies will really jack up your copay. And there's also more wickets you have to go through in order to get the medical treatment that you need in the first place. So what this legislation does is say, okay, no more of that, okay? Uh, a medical problem is a medical problem, whether it's on the behavioral or mental health side or the physical health side. Everybody, you know, should be treated the same by the insurance companies. Uh, so the copay should be uh, uh, similar and, and, and equitable, and uh, the requirements to actually get the service coming through the uh, and have it paid for through the insurance companies shouldn't be different either. And that's what this legislation does. Uh, we worked on it all year. It uh, it passed early on in the Senate. The House passed it towards the tail end of session, and I was uh, I was very pleased about that. Okay, so and essentially you ch you made a state law requiring this. Yes, yes, just to make it a little more equitable for people having to deal with uh, any health issue they, that they uh, have to go to the hospital or go to the doctor for. Yeah. Uh, the other one was uh, um, the. the uh, the the state uh, ban on bump stocks, and of course this all came up, you know, just about a year ago when uh, when that person shot into the crowd in Las Vegas and uh, uh, killed I, I think 52 people. Something he killed. like that, yeah. And uh, what you don't hear so much about is that the volume of fire was so high that he wounded uh, more than 800. So there are people out there, a lot of people out there, who are dealing with gunshot wounds that, in some cases, uh, permanently change your life. Yeah. You know, and you know, you hear about the, uh, uh, you know, the unfortunates that, that are that are killed, but the rest of that human cost in yeah. terms of the wounded is uh, is huge. So, uh, so, and we got that 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 flew right through to everyone was uh, okay those are the bump stocks that you could retrofit it, into yeah a, they, you, you you add a you add something to the outside of the trigger housing on a on a, uh, a semi-automatic rifle and it keeps and uh, the recoil action uh once you once you pull the trigger it 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 keeps that trigger action going so it it mimics an automatic weapon so you get a really yeah. high rate of fire if you remember the news clips from when that uh when that person was shooting it sounded like a machine gun. Yeah. And uh, and sure enough, that's that's what these devices do. So now they're outlawed in Rhode Island. That's a lot, awful lot of bullets to be flying around out there. If 800 oh, uh, yeah. people were oh, yeah. wounded. Yeah. It's uh, and and it doesn't allow you to aim the weapon very well because it's jumping around. Yeah. Because the uh, uh, the firing mechanism is based on the recoil. So I mean, it's all you can really do with it is shoot into a large amorphous target like a crowd. Yeah. So. Okay, so what this what this bill did then is outlaw bump stocks in Rhode Island. Right. If you have a bump stock, you've got to get rid of it. And there's a certain period of time. I think I think we gave uh, 90 days. If you've got one, you've got to get rid of it. Yeah. Well, that's certainly a good step in the direction of sure. trying to address the gun problem in yeah. the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Plenty more to be done, though. I think. Plenty, plenty more to be done. I was uh, I was uh, I was disappointed that the. Uh, the safe schools bill uh, didn't get to the floor in, in either chamber. Um, I mean, that would uh, right now there's uh, there's a, a loophole in uh, in gun law in Rhode Island that will allow you if you have 
a concealed carry permit, you can bring a gun on school grounds. Um, my own view on that is uh, it, it's a huge safety issue. And uh, uh, if you're not a police officer, if you're not a, if you're not a public safety official, um, you should not have, uh, you should not bring a weapon yeah. onto, onto school grounds. There's, there's, no, there's no reason for that. And uh, so it did not, that, that bill did not come to the floor. Um, but uh, to his credit, the, uh, uh, the uh, commissioner of uh, K through 12, Ken Wagner, um, brought that forward under the auspices of the, the, the more general law that says the Rowland Department of Education is required to provide a safe environment for school children. And under that broad uh, legal requirement, he said, okay, nobody brings a school, uh, nobody brings a gun onto school property unless you're a police officer. Yeah. Uh, and then the governor rolled right in <coughs> and, and made that an executive order. So. Uh, speaking of concealed carry, I know maybe in the last year or so there was a issue about people, the, the state of Rhode Island, recognizing concealed carry permits from other states. Right, right. Did anything ever happen to that? No, no, nothing. Uh, not that that didn't go anywhere. Um, you know, this was all about reciprocal agreements between sure between states, and uh, when you do that, you you sort of lose visibility into what it takes to get a, a, a permit because that now is depending upon some other state and uh, if you've got a reciprocal agreement with them you're going you're going to uh, you're going to accept into your state uh, someone with a concealed carry but you don't really know the pedigree of that in terms of training and all right. the other stuff that goes along with responsible uh, ownership use of a firearm. Yeah. Uh, very heavy issues up there. That certainly the school safety is a big one for yeah. everybody. Yeah. Um, what are the good parts of your, your job? What's the most gratifying part of being a state senator? Um, well, I mean, uh, it's all pretty gratifying. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a good thing to be a part of the legislative process. It can be very frustrating, and it certainly is slow, and uh, cooperation between the two chambers is sometimes a, uh, a, a big challenge. Um, I would like to see, uh, I, I would like to see a little bit less leadership authority and more opportunity for bills to get to the floor. Um, you know that 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 can be a challenge. I mean, there has to be controls over the whole process because there's a huge number of uh, of bills uh, that get introduced. You know, and you couldn't possibly hear all of them on the floor. So, you know, they're making the hard decisions on which ones uh, you know get out of committee and uh, and, and get to the floor. And uh, I'd just like to see some some of that. I'd like to participate more in uh, in. Uh, the decision process. Yeah. Now, if you ask me, well, how would you do that? I don't really know. Well, but I ask you, what's the best part of being yeah. a state senator? The best. Surely, the, there are some the, of those. Too. The best. The best part, I think, is just dealing with the people, because the, the problems that come up, people will come to you with, uh, with issues, and uh, I was really uh, impressed with the, uh, um, the apparatus, the tools that you have access to. And helping people deal with day-to-day -day problems because when it comes right down to it those are the problems that mean most to the person you're talking to at that moment and it's very nice to be able to say you know you call the right person and here's what i can do and then go off and really do it yeah. and a lot of that is facilitated through uh through a, a, a group of people on in each chamber has uh, uh, a constituent services group and these people are mostly double-hatted, like the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the clerk of the Senate is also the director of uh, constituent services for the Senate side. So I can send him an email, I'll call him up and say, hey, I talked to a person and they've got this problem. And it runs the gamut of everything from 
I don't like where my neighbor's parking his truck out on the road because I can't see trying to get out of my driveway. You know, or can you tell National Grid to move a telephone pole? It's too close to my driveway and I'm afraid I'm going to hit it coming in and out. It, it runs from those kinds of things to last week I, I got a call from a person um, who had been out of work. He hurt his back and he'd been out of work for like almost three months and he couldn't get his TDI started. Now that's the uh, that, that's the uh, the disability insurance that you pay for automatically through your paychecks, the, the state disability insurance program. He wasn't getting paid. I called constituent services and they had that straightened out like the next day. Yeah. Um, so, so those are the good points. Those are the, those are the good points. You really are in a position to help people. Yeah. So call me if you got that's a problem. That's call all me good. Up. Call me up. Yeah, yeah. I think we're going to have your uh, your contact information up on the screen a couple times. Good. Uh, uh, you talked about some of your frustrations with the system. I guess. Right. Um, I mean, it's it's slow. I mean, I, in general. Our governmental processes, certainly the legislative processes, yeah. are intended to be slow. Well, and I can understand that. Yeah, I mean, it requires a process and uh, and, and thought and debate and and uh, and, uh, and a full discussion in full view of everybody. You know, I mean, one of the other bright spots uh, in both the Senate and the House, if you if you want to uh, to understand a particular piece of legislation. It will not get to the floor in either chamber until there's a hearing, and those hearings are open, and you sign your name on a list so that you can speak to the issue, and those hearings continue on until everyone who wants to speak gets the opportunity. And sometimes, like with some of the gun bills, some of the other more contentious yeah. social issues and all that, there's hundreds of people signed up, and everybody gets to speak. And if we're there till 2 o'clock in the morning, to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. It's not very convenient, but you stay there until everyone has their fair opportunity. Yeah. And uh, I really like that. I mean, we did, you know, the, the Pawtucket Red Sox thing, I mean, it didn't turn out very well. That was a, yeah. a disappointing That was exercise. gonna be one of my questions down the, down the list, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we went all over the state. The Senate went all over the, the, the state. We had nine or ten public hearings. We had one at URI, we had one up at Bryant College, we had one over here in the East Bay at Roger Williams, all over the state so people could speak their piece on what to do about the Pawtucket Red Sox. And so we got a really robust uh, set of inputs from everybody, from experts. We, had a, we flew a guy in from Michigan who was an expert in, uh, in sporting venues and whether or not they made money and uh, which ones did and which ones didn't and why. Um, right down to, you know, the lady who hasn't missed a Pawtucket Red Sox game in like 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and everyone, everyone got to speak. Uh, the disappointment there was that uh, when the Senate came into session last year, we voted right away, you know, on a, uh, uh, a deal um, between the state, between the city of Pawtucket and the team based on all those hearings. It passed on the Senate floor in January, uh, and then it just lingered till almost the, the last day of session over in the House side, and they uh, put together, you know, some changes, and I, you know, I'm, a lot of people are, uh, are expressing opinions on what the motivations were, and I don't, I don't know what the motivations were, uh, any more than anybody else really, but it failed. Okay, it was, uh, the, the team wouldn't accept it, and now we've lost them. And, and the Pawtucket Red Sox, for years and years and years, for decades, have been a money maker uh, as a business for themselves, good for them, but for the state too. Sure. Uh, they've had anywhere from two to three million dollars in tax revenue come to the state um, every year, and that's gone now. Yeah. You know, I mean, two or three million dollars. It's well. Pl plus, it's a Rhode Island tradition. Uh, well, and, you know, all all of those, and we heard all of that related to <coughs> tradition, uh, to uh, you know, an, an iconic activity uh, that's been a part of the state and a part of Pawtucket for yeah. decades. Um, and, and everybody took that 
into account, but uh, you know, I mean, the business asp aspects of it, you know, have to have to drive because um, you're making decisions that affect taxpayers and uh, and all that. And uh, you know, I thought we were on a good path, but uh, it got derailed somewhere along the line there. And uh, yeah, and uh, so now they're gone. Well, they now will they're be. Gone. I, I guess Worcester paid a few bucks more though than yeah. they were willing to yeah. do. Yeah, so. uh, I mean, and I, I I I agreed with the governor's sentiment on that too. That uh, that the 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 deal that Worcester put together, which which approached a hundred million dollars, um, I hope I hope they make it work out for them. Uh, I would not have signed up to that for Rhode Island. Yeah. So. Well, again, you can't have everything, I guess. And it's right. one of those things that was right. kind of doomed, I guess, from the beginning because of the money issue. Well, I, you know, I don't know that it was doomed from the beginning because it it was going to continue to be a money maker. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't work out, yeah. you know. So not a great thing for the state of Rhode Island as far as you're concerned. That's right. certainly the way I feel. And right. Probably a lot of my friends feel that way. I mean, there's a monetary loss there as well as the loss of that iconic, uh, you know, status as the home of the Pawtucket Red Sox. Yeah. And, and all that. So I wonder, I wonder what they're going to call it, the Woe Sox? Or <laughs> not my problem. Not <laughs> your problem. Uh, you know, a big part of your job, and you've touched on it several times already, is listening to your constituents. Right, right. Uh, now, how have, you, how have you been able to do that? What are some of the mechanisms you use to hear what your constituents have to say? Well, uh, the one that works best and easiest for me is call me on my cell phone. You know, my pocket rings and I answer and it's me and that person who wants to talk to me right now. Yeah. And I plaster my cell number everywhere. It's on my cards that the Senate gives me. It's on my website. It's on my campaign literature, you know. Uh, you can even put it up on that TV monitor if you want. Yeah. Um, but call me on the cell phone. What is it? It's 401-626-7227. So call me up. I'm the one that answers, and uh, I can likely find a way to help you. Well, it doesn't get more direct than that. That's, that's uh, you know, great. That's, that's really all, all it is. Some of these little get-togethers that you have... Uh, you know, food works and other yeah, places. Yeah. Uh, are those, those, do you get some ideas from those? Or? Yeah. Um, the problem with that, those are, I, I hold constituent meetings at least once per session. Um, I hold one in each town. Um, but the issue is you don't get many people showing up. I mean, it's a lot to ask. People are busy. They've got other things to do. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's happening at the State House might not be uh, very close to the top of their list of things they want to get done today, so it's hard. To, it's hard to get. So you don't get very many people. You, you get, in my experience, you get people who are already involved and already cognizant of the issues, and you know they come because they are interested and they want to either share their insight or ask you a question or whatever. But uh, um, I think you get a better feel uh, just answering the phone when people call. You know, trying to help. Yeah. Um, you get a good feel uh, for the issues and what people think when you're on the floor of the chamber. Um, the really fun part uh, is just before the bell rings and, uh, and and you go into session. That's how they all start. They all start with everybody gathered in the chamber on each side first, and you go through all the general business that you know, whether it's a floor vote on something or whatever it might be. In some cases, there's ceremonial stuff that happens. But before, just before that happens, the place is packed with all sorts of people. Uh, some of them are lobbyists. Some of them are just members of groups like Moms Demand Action and, and uh, I, you, you name it, the substance abuse prevention folks. Uh, so you get uh, a broad opportunity to talk to all sorts of people on all sorts of issues. And it's interesting, and, it, and it's fun, and it's a, it's a nice part of the process. Then the bell rings, everybody has to get out, you know, and when, when you get into your official business of the day. Yeah, so I guess uh, what's, what's of interest to me is that you deal with a lot of, like, individual issues. Yeah. As opposed to the big overarching issues like school security and the rest of the stuff. Well, you, you deal with both. Well, you know, one's certainly the bigger issues are a much more formal setting. Yeah, but I'm saying you get more of, the impact, more of the input. 
Um, well, I mean, you have the hearings for the formal stuff, for the, for the big stuff, and uh, so you get plenty of input all around. Um, but the personal stuff, when someone's just calling you on the phone or they see you, uh, you know, when you're eating your breakfast down at uh, in one of the local um, restaurants, you know, that's, the personal stuff is, is, uh, is good too. That, yeah. that touches you more. Actually, uh, that, that makes me feel much more comfortable that uh, the idea that somebody, I can call up my senator and just say, hey, I'm concerned about this. I hope and you'll listen. I hope we haven't lost that that yeah. concept because we work for you, you know? Well, I look at that, you look at that. I'm not sure everybody looks at it that way. Well, I hope they start looking at it. And that goes all the way up to Washington. Yeah, you know? well, I, you know. Um, Beyond your page. I can, sp I can speak about myself, okay? If you've got an issue, if you've got a question, yeah. you just want to talk. Yeah. 401-626-7227. Give okay. me a call. Okay, super. Let me, let me ask you, this is a tough question, I think. What kind of grade would you give yourself for your first uh, term as a senator? Not that great. Not that great. Uh, you know, the, my my biggest flagship piece of legislation uh, didn't get through the process, and that's uh, you know my 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 number one issue is uh, prevention. Uh, programs for the substance abuse problems that yeah. we have. And I'm specifically interested in, uh, in, in those programs for our school age kids because there's a problem with our school age kids. And I'm talking about middle school kids. Yeah. Uh, and it's alcohol, it's drugs, you name it. And, and as you get into the high school years, uh, it's certainly there as well. And uh, there are laws on the books that will provide revenue streams uh, to support those programs, um, those laws are there, but in some cases they're flawed, so they're not being executed. And that means money that should be going to help combat this problem, which everyone says, hey, this is my number one priority. Right. Okay. Well, there was a bill that, uh, that I sponsored on the Senate side, Representative J. Edwards sponsored on the House side. It passed on the Senate floor. Um, didn't pass in the House. There were concerns. I, I'm not sure what the concerns were, but the bill did not pass, and uh, there was fairly significant monies that could come from levying a fee associated with speeding tickets. And believe me, the state levies a lot of speeding tickets in the course of a year, uh, and there were fees that would have accrued to go specifically to uh, two programs. The, uh, the network of prevention coalitions that exist in all all the counties in the state, most of the towns have a have a local one. We've got a, the Portsmouth uh, uh, Substance Abuse uh, Prevention Coalition, very active. In fact, if I can put in a plug for them, they just got awarded a big yes. uh, uh, DFC, which is a Drug Free Communities federal grant, and it's like six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. One hundred twenty-five thousand dollars per year for five years. And once you get the first one, then you're qualified to continue to apply to keep that going over the years. And, uh, and these people are dedicated and they're smart and they'll do a good job with that money. And this is what we've been trying for five years yeah. uh, to get this grant. And thanks to uh, Ray Davis and Rebecca Elwell and uh, uh, all, the, all the leadership with the, uh, with the prevention uh, coalition, they, they've, they've, stuck at, they've stuck to it been persistent and they got it this year and that's going to be a big deal for our community yeah uh, on my end of it I didn't get the money that I wanted to so I'll keep working on that so good so I wasn't I was not an A student in my first term you know I, I can't imagine that anybody would would consider that they were I think it's so complex and so different I know you're on the town council for years yeah but it's just different, I would think, going up to the state. Well, it is. It's it is a little bit different. It's not really that complicated, but it's it's hard because you you know you got to build consensus. Yeah. You got to build consensus between two very different uh, chambers. Yeah. Um, everyone is representing a certain constituency around the state. Those constituencies have differences, 
you know. So trying to get something done, you know. I mean, th this bill was dirt simple. It was fixing a problem with existing law, and we could not get it done. And, and you know. Yeah. Uh, but I'll try again, and it'll be the first bill that I uh, I resubmit in for, for to, to introduce in January. The Safe Schools Bill, that's uh, Senator Harold Metz from Providence, that's his bill. He's been submitting that for years, and uh, I will certainly be proud to be a co-sponsor with him because that will be resubmitted as well to put the weight of law behind uh, the governor's uh, executive order on keeping the guns out of schools. Yeah. Well, I know it can't be too complex if we send an ex-naval aviator <laughs> up, to the, uh, up to the Senate. All right. I, I, sir, I deserve Sorry, that. Jim. I had to throw that in. I, uh, I, I'm sure I deserve that. <laughs> Jim, do you see any chance of the line item veto legislation uh, making it into the Senate floor this year? Yeah, I, I do. Um, uh, the line item veto is, uh, is, is generally supported throughout the Senate. Um, and I, I think it, I think it's a good thing. I support it, and I will certainly, uh, uh, given the opportunity, vote for it to, uh, to be invoked. I mean, there are some details that have to be worked out. There are many ways to implement the line item veto, but I think it's a good thing, and we should do it. Okay, great. Uh, we've got an issue coming up here in Portsmouth, got to do with Redwood Farms in that area, that neighborhood, and right. the Navy. Right. Uh, how, how do you get involved in this? Do you liaison with us? Well, once again, people call you up or, you know, you see them. I, I mean, I learned about this knocking on doors down in Overlook Point, which is one of the affected neighborhoods. And, yeah, there's, there's a concern because the Navy may uh, decide to extend their fence out to the physical boundaries of their property. And for a, a few houses in uh, Overlook Point and certainly in Redwood Farms, that would make for some issues for the, for the abutting uh, homeowners yeah. there. But the Navy is talking. And uh, I think if the, if the Navy's talking, that's a yeah. good thing. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. I mean, there, you know, there's no surprises here. Yeah. And you know, the Navy has a mission, and a part of that is uh, uh, to uh, to execute more efficiently. And part of that is, you know, lower electricity bills. Right. So that's what this is about. They want to put a solar field in, and it depends on how their uh, how their plan goes. But they're talking to us, and I think they'll try to accommodate the. Uh, the homeowners as best okay, they can. Good. I, let me, we, let, we'll ask them. Let me throw in one last question. I know you met the Lord Mayor from Portsmouth, UK. Uh, had a, had dinner with him and did some stuff. What did you think about that I, visit? What you a, got thirty he, seconds. He's, he's a he's a great guy, you know, and he's here only because of uh, all of your efforts. The whole team that put together the uh, 375th uh, anniversary celebration and invited those folks to come over here to their namesake town. Uh, and then continue that relationship. I think it's absolutely terrific. Good. Jim, thanks very much for coming on. I hope to see you again soon. My pleasure. And uh, I'm signing off, Doug Smith here, and we'll see you next time on Portsmouth This Week. Hello, I'm Jerry LePage from Child and Family Elder Services. I'm speaking to you today about uh, our friendly visitor program, which matches background check volunteers with lonely seniors. If you're interested in learning more about the program, I encourage you to give me a call at 401-848-4185. Thank you.